Chapter Twelve of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. You have a great deal to lose, General Smale was saying, and nothing to gain by your stubbornness. You're a young man, vigorous and, I'm sure, intelligent. You have a fortune of some million and a quarter dollars, which I assure you you'll be permitted to keep. As against that prospect, so long as you refuse to cooperate, we must regard you as no better than a traitorous criminal, and deal with you accordingly. What have you been feeding me? I said. My mouth tastes like somebody's old gym shoes, and my arm's purple to the elbow. Don't you know it's illegal to administer drugs without a license? The nation's security is at stake, snapped Smale. The funny thing is, it must not have worked or you wouldn't be begging me to tell all. I thought that scopolamine, or whatever you're using, was the real goods. We've got nothing but gibberish, Smale said, most of it in an incomprehensible language. Who the devil are you, Legion? Where do you come from? You know everything, I said. You told me yourself. I'm a guy named Legion, from Mount Sterling, Illinois, population 1,892. I'm a humane man, Legion, but if necessary, I'll beat it out of you. You? I smiled, curling a lip. You mean you're calling a herd of plug uglies, real crooks, to do the dirty work. My only crime is knowing something you politicians want, and you're willing to lie, cheat, steal, torture, and kill to get it. You know that, and so do I. Let's not kid each other. I know your measure as a man, Mr. General. Smale had gone white. I'm in a position to inflict agonies on you, you insolent rotter, he grated. I've refrained from doing so. You might add that to your analysis of my character. I'm a soldier. I know my duty. I'm prepared to give my life, if need be, my honor. I'm even prepared to forego your good opinion so long as I obtain from my government the information you are withholding. Turn me loose, then ask me, in a nice way. As far as I know, I haven't got anything of military significance to tell you. But if I were treated as a free citizen, I might be inclined to let you be the judge of that. Tell us now, then you'll go free. Sure, I said. I invented a combination rocket ship and time machine. I traveled around the solar system and made a few short trips back into history. In my spare time, I invented other gadgets. I'm planning to take out patents, so naturally I don't intend to spill any secrets. Can I go now? Smale got to his feet. Until we can safely move you, you'll remain in this room. You're on the 63rd floor of the Jordano building. The windows are of unbreakable glass, in case you contemplate a particularly untidy suicide. Your person has been stripped of all potentially dangerous items, though I suppose you could still swallow your tongue and suffocate. The door is of heavy construction and securely locked. I forgot to tell you, I said. I mailed the letter to a friend, telling him all about you. The sheriff will be here with a posse any minute now to spring me. You mailed no letter, Smale said. Unfortunately, we don't feel it would be advisable to allow any furniture to remain here, which you might be foolish enough to dismantle for use as a weapon. It's rather a drab room to spend your future in, but until you decide to cooperate, this will be your world. I didn't say anything. I sat on the floor and watched them leave. I caught a glimpse of two uniformed men outside the door. No doubt they'd take turns looking through the peephole. I'd have solitude without privacy. I wondered if Margareta had managed to mail the cylinder. I stretched out on the floor, which was padded with a nice thick rug, presumably so that I wouldn't beat my brains out against it just to spite them. I was way behind on my sleep. Being interrogated while unconscious wasn't a very restful procedure. I wasn't too worried. In spite of what Smale said, they couldn't keep me here forever. Maybe Margareta had gotten clear and told the story to some newsmen. 
This kind of thing couldn't stay hidden forever. Or could it? I thought about what Smale had said about my talking gibberish under the narcotics. That was an odd one. Quite suddenly I got it. By means of the drugs, they must have tapped a level where the Valonian background briefing was stored. They'd been firing questions at a set of memories that didn't speak English. I grinned, then laughed out loud. Luck was still in the saddle with me. The glass was in double panels, set in aluminum frames and sealed with a plastic strip. The space between the two panels of glass was evacuated of air, creating an insulating barrier against the heat of the sun. I ran a finger over the aluminum. It was dural, good tough stuff. If I had something to pry with, I might possibly lever the metal away from the glass far enough to take a crack at the edge, the weak point of armor glass, if I had something to hit it with. Smale had done a good job of stripping the room and me. I had my shirt and pants and shoes, but no tie or belt. I still had my wallet, empty, a pack of cigarettes with two wilted weeds in it, and a box of matches. Smale had missed a bet. I might set fire to my hair and burn to the ground. I might also stuff a sock down my throat and strangle, or hang myself with a shoelace. But I wasn't going to. I looked at the window some more. The door was too tough to tackle, and the heavies outside were probably hoping for an excuse to work me over. They wouldn't expect me to go after the glass. After all, I was still sixty-three stories up. What would I do if I did make it to the windowsill? But we could worry about that later, after I had smelled the fresh air. My forefinger found an irregularity in the smooth metal, a short groove. I looked closer, saw a screw head set flush with the aluminum surface. Maybe if the frame was bolted together. No such luck. The screw I had found was the only one. What was it for? Maybe if I removed it I'd find out. But I'd wait until dark to try it. Smale hadn't left a light fixture in the room. After sundown, I'd be able to work unobserved. A couple of hours went by, and no one came to disturb my solitude. Not even to feed me. Maybe they planned to starve me out, or maybe they weren't used to being jailers and had forgotten the animals had to be fed. I had a short scrap of metal I'd worked loose from my wallet. It was mild steel, flimsy stuff, only about an inch long. But I was hoping the screw might not be set too tight. Aluminum threads strip pretty easily, so it probably wasn't cinched up too hard. There was no point in theorizing. It was dark now. I'd give it a try. I went to the window, fitted the edge of metal into the slotted screw head, and twisted. It turned, just like that. I backed it off ten turns. Twenty. It was a thick bolt with fine threads. It came free, and air whooshed into the hole. The screw apparently sealed the panel after the air was evacuated. I thought it over. If I could fill the space between the panels with water and let it freeze, quite a trick in the tropics, I might as well plan to fill it with gin and set it on fire. I was going in circles. Every idea I had started with if. I needed something I could manage with the materials at hand cloth, a box of matches, a few bits of paper. I got out a cigarette, lit it up, and while the match was burning, examined the hole from which I'd removed the plug. It was about three-sixteenths of an inch in diameter and an inch deep, and there was a hole near the bottom communicating with the airspace between the glass panels. It was an old-fashioned method of manufacture, but it seemed to have worked all right. The air was pumped out and the hole sealed with the screw. It had, at any rate, the advantage of being easy to service if the panel leaked. Now, with some way of pumping air in, I could blow out the panels. There was no pump on the premises, but I did have some chemicals, the match heads. They were old style too, like a lot of things in Peru, the strike once and throw away kind. I sat on the floor and started to work, chipping the heads off the matchsticks, collecting the dry purplish material on a scrap of paper. Thirty-eight matches gave me a respectable sample. I packed it together, rolled it in the paper, and crimped the ends. 
Then I tucked the makeshift firecracker into the hole the screw had come from. Using the metal scrap, I scraped at the threads of the screw, burring them. Then I started it in the hole half a dozen turns, until it came up against the match heads. The shoes Margareta had bought me were the latest thing in Lima styles, with thin soles, pointed toes, and built-up leather heels. Bad on the feet, but just a thing to pound with. I thought about trying to work loose a piece of rug to shield my face, but decided against it. I'd have to stand aside and take my chances. I took the shoe by the toe and hefted it. The flexible sole gave it a good action, like a well-made sap. There were still a couple of ifs in the equation, but a healthy crack on the screw ought to drive it against the packed match heads hard enough to detonate them, and the expanding gases from the explosion ought to exert enough pressure against the glass panels to break them. I'd know in a second. I flattened myself against the wall, brought the shoe up, and laid it on the screw head with everything I had. There was a deafening boom, a blast of hot air, and a chemical stink. Then a gust of cool night wind, and I was on the sill, my back to the street six hundred feet below, my fingers groping for a hold on the ledge above the window. I found a grip, pulled up, reached higher, got my feet on the muntin strip, paused to rest for three seconds, reached again. I pulled my feet above the window level and heard shouts in the room below. Fool killed himself! Get a light in here! I clung, breathing deep and murmured thanks to the architect who had stressed a strong horizontal element in his façade and arranged the strip windows in bays set twelve inches from the face of the structure. Now, if the boys below would keep their eyes on the street long enough for me to get on the roof... I looked up to get an idea how far I'd have to go, and gripped the ledge convulsively as the whole building leaned out, tilting me back. Cold sweat ran into my eyes. I squeezed the stone until my knuckles creaked and held on. I laid my cheek against the rough plaster, listening to my heart thump. Adrenaline and high hopes had gotten me this far, and now it had all drained out, and left me, a frail ground-loving animal, flattened against the cruel face of a tower, like a fly on a ceiling, with nothing between me and the unyielding concrete below but the feeble grip of fingers and toes. I started to yell for help, and the words stuck in my dry throat. I breathed in shallow gasps, feeling my muscles tightening, until I hung rigid as a board, afraid even to roll my eyeballs for fear of dislodging myself. I closed my eyes, felt my hands going numb, and tried again to yell. Only a thin croak emerged. A minute earlier I had had only one worry, that they'd look up and see me. Now my worst fear was that they wouldn't. This was the end. I'd been close before, but not like this. My fingers could take the strain for maybe another minute, maybe even two. Then I'd let go, and the wind would whip at me for a few timeless seconds before I hit. I had had a lot of big ideas. But in the cosmic scheme, I was a gnat on a windshield. I thought I'd learned something. Was a jump ahead of most guys and could play the meaningless game with a certain flair. But my fancy philosophies were words written in smoke when they came up against the raw power of blind instinct. My conscious mind had an IQ of 148. But the idiot subconscious that had frozen me here hadn't learned anything since the first ape that had owned it rode out a storm in a treetop and lived to be my ancestor. I heard a sound, and it was me, whimpering. I was a poor weakling, out of his element, bleeding for mercy. Down inside of me, something didn't like the picture. A small defiance flickered, found a foothold, burned brighter. I would die, but that would solve a lot of problems. And if I had to die, at least I could die trying. My mind moved in to take over from my body. It was the body that was wasting my last strength on a precarious illusion of safety numbing my senses, paralyzing me. It was a tyranny I wouldn't accept. I needed a cool head and a steady hand and an unimpaired sense of balance, and if the imbecile body wouldn't cooperate, the mind would take it by the scruff of the neck and force it. 
I'd been feeding this hulk for thirty-odd years. Now it would do what I told it. First, loosen the grip. Yes, if it killed me. Bend those fingers. Sure, I might fall, all the way, and splatter when I hit. But did this lousy slab of meat expect to live forever? I had news for it. Time was short, any way you figured. I was standing a little looser now, my hands resting flat, my legs taking a load. I had a good wide ledge to stand on, nearly a foot. And in a minute, I was going to reach up and get a new hold and lift one foot at a time. And if I slipped, at least I'd have done it my way. I let go, and the building leaned out, and to hell with it. I felt for the next ledge, gripped it, pulled up, found a toehold. Sure, I was dead. It was a long way to the top, and there was a fancy cornice I'd never get over. But when the moment came and I started the long ride down, I'd thumb my nose at the old hag instinct, who hadn't been as tough as she thought she was. I was under the cornice now, hanging on for a breather, and listening to the hooting and hollering from the window far below. A couple of heads had popped out and taken a look, but it was dark up where I was, and all the attention was centered down, where the crowd had gathered and lights were playing, looking for a mess. Pretty soon now they'd begin to get the drift, so I'd better be going. I looked up at the overhang and felt the old urge to clutch and hang on, so I leaned out a little further just to show me who was boss. It was a long reach, and I'd have to risk it all on one lunge, because if I missed, there wasn't any net, and my fingers knew it. I heard my nails rasp on the plaster. I grated my teeth together and unhooked one hand. It was like a claw carved from wood. I took a half-breath, bent my knees slightly. They were as responsive as a couple of bumper jacks bolted on to the hip. Tough, but it was now or never. I let go with both hands and stretched, leaning back. My wooden hands bumped the edge, scrabbled, hooked on, as my legs swung free, and I was hanging like an old-time sailor strung up by the thumbs. A wind off the roof whipped at my face, and now I was a tissue-paper doll fluttering in the breeze. I had to pull now, pull hard, heave myself up and over the edge. But I was tired, too tired. My cray paper arms with the wooden hands seemed to belong to someone else, someone who'd been dead a long time. But the someone was me. Death was an old story, one that I wrote myself. This was something that had happened before, long ago, and the palindrome of life was finished where it started, and a dark curtain was falling. Then, from the darkness, a voice was speaking in a strange language a confusion of strange thought symbols, but through them an ever more insistent call. Dilate the secondary vascular complex. Shunt full conductivity to the upsilon neurochannel. Now, stripping oxygen ions from fatty cell masses, pour in electrochemical energy to the sinews. With a smooth surge of power, I pulled myself up, fell forward, rolled onto my back, and lay on the flat roof. The beautiful flat roof, still warm from the day's sun. I was here, looking at the stars, safe. And later on, when I had more time, I'd stop to think about it. But now I had to move, before they had time to organize themselves, cordon off the building, and start a floor-by-floor -floor search. Staggering from the exertion of the long climb, I got to my feet, went to the shed housing the entry to the service stair. The door was locked. I didn't waste any time kicking at it. I got a leg up and stood on the doorknob. Two jumps and it snapped off. I pushed the stub of the shaft through and tickled the back edge of the locking tongue, eased it out. The door opened. A short flight of steps led down to a storeroom. There were dusty boards, dried-up paint cans, odd tools. I picked up a five-foot length of two-by-four and a hammer with one claw missing, and stepped out into the hall. The street was a long way down, and I didn't feel like wasting time with stairs. I found the elevator, pushed the button, stood in front of it, whistling. A fat man in a drab suit came along, 
looked at me distastefully, thought about telling me that workmen used the freight elevator, then changed his mind and said nothing. The elevator arrived. I stepped in jauntily. The fat man followed me, pushed the button for the foyer. I smiled and nodded, went on whistling. We stopped and the doors opened. I waited for the fat man to leave, then glanced out, tightening my grip on the hammer, and followed. I could see the lights in the street out front, and in the distance there was the wail of a siren. But nobody in the lobby looked my way. I headed across toward the side exit, dumped the board at the door, tucked the hammer in the waistband of my pants, and stepped out onto the pavement. There were a lot of people hurrying past, but this was Lima. They didn't waste a glance on a barefooted carpenter. I moved off, not hurrying. There was a lot of rough country between me and Itzenka, the little town near which the lifeboat was hidden in a canyon, but I aimed to cover it in a week. Sometime between now and tomorrow I'd have to figure out a way to equip myself with a few necessities, but I wasn't worried. A man who had successfully taken up human fly work in middle life wouldn't have any trouble stealing a pair of boots. Foster had shoved off for home three years ago, local time although to him, aboard the ship, only a few weeks might have passed. My lifeboat was a midge compared to the mother ship he rode, but it had plenty of speed. Once aboard the lugger, and maybe I could put a little space between me and the big boys I was up against now. I had used the best camouflage I knew of on the boat. The near savage native bearers who had done my unloading, and carried my Valonian treasures across the desert to the nearest railhead were not the gossipy type. If General Smale's boys had heard about the boat, they hadn't mentioned it, and if they had, well, I'd solve that one when I got to it. There were still quite a few ifs in the equation, but my arithmetic was getting better all the time. End of chapter 12《ハッピーバースデートゥーユー》この番組は、Keith Laumer。This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. I took the precaution of sneaking up on the lifeboat in the dead of night, but I could have saved myself a crawl. Except for the fact that the camouflage nets had rotted away to shreds, the ship was just as I had left it, door sealed. Why Smale's team hadn't found it, I didn't know. I'd think that went over when I was well away from Earth. It had been a long, tough trip from Lima to the canyon, but I had made it without interference. I had swapped my platinum finger ring for a beat-up thirty-eight pistol, but I hadn't had to use it. In a shabby bar in one of the villages I passed through, I heard a battered radio sputtering news. There was no mention of the assault on the island, or of my escape. It seemed that all parties were willing to cover it up and pretend it hadn't happened. I went into the post office at Itzenka and picked up the parcel Margareta had mailed me with Foster's memory trace in it. While I was checking to see whether Uncle Sam's minions had intercepted the package and substituted a carrot, I felt something rubbing against my shin. I glanced down and saw a gray and white cat, reasonably clean and obviously hungry. I don't know whether I'd plowed through a field of wild catnip the night before or if it was my way with a finger behind the furry ears, but Kitty followed me out of Itzenka and right into the bush. She kept pace with me, leading most of the way, as far as the space boat, and was the first one aboard. I didn't waste time with formalities. I had once audited a briefing rod on the boat's operation, not that I had ever expected to use the information for a takeoff. Once aboard, I hit the controls and cut a swath through the atmosphere that must have sent fingers jumping for panic buttons from Washington to Moscow. I didn't know how many weeks or months of unsullied leisure stretched ahead of me now. There would be time and to spare for exploring the boat, working out a daily routine, chewing over the details of both my memories, and laying plans for my arrival on Foster's world, Valen. But first, I wanted to catch a show that was making a one-night stand for me only, the awe-inspiring spectacle of the retreating Earth. I dropped into a seat opposite the screen and flipped into view the big luminous ball of wool that was my home planet. 
I'd been hoping to get a last look at my island, but I couldn't see it. The whole sphere was blanketed in cloud, a thin worn blanket in places, but still intact. But the moon was a sight, an undipped Edom cheese with the markings of Roquefort. For a quarter of an hour I watched it grow until it filled my screen. It was too close for comfort. I dumped the tabby out of my lap and adjusted a dial. The dead world swept past, and I had a brief glimpse of burst bubbles of craters that became the eyes and mouth and pockmarks of a face on a head that swung away from me in disdain. And then the sibling planets dwindled and were gone forever. The lifeboat was completely equipped, and I found comfortable quarters. An ample food supply was available by the touch of a panel on the table in the screen room. That was a trick my predecessor with the dental jewelry hadn't discovered, I guessed. During the courses of my first journey earthward, and on my visits to the boat for saleable playthings while she sat in dry dock, I had discovered most of the available amenities aboard. Now I luxuriated in a steaming bath of recycled water, sponged down with disposable towels packed in scented alcohol, fed the cat and myself, and lay down to sleep for about two weeks. By the third week I was reasonably refreshed and rested. The scars from my recent brushes with what passed as the law were healed. I had gotten over regretting the toys I'd left behind on my island and the money in my banks in Lima and Switzerland, and even Margareta. I was headed for a new world. There was no point in dragging along old attachments. The cat was a godsend, I began to realize. I named her Itzenka, after the village where she adopted me, and I talked to her by the hour. I always had felt that there was a subtle difference between talking to somebody else and talking to yourself. The latter gets a little tedious after the first few days, but you can keep the other up indefinitely. So it's got talked to plenty as we rode to the stars. Say, it's, said I, where would you like your sandbox situated? Right there in front of the TV screen? There's not much traffic there since we cleared the solar system. You'd have the place all to yourself. No, said Idzenka, by a flirt of her tail, and she walked over behind a crate that had never been unloaded on Earth. I pulled out a box of junk and slid the sandbox in its place. Idzenka promptly lost interest and instead jumped up on the junk box, which fell off the bench, and scattered small objects of calf and metal in all directions. Come back here, blast you! I said, and help me pick up this stuff. It's bounded after a dull gleaming silver object that was still rolling. I was there almost as quick as she was, and grabbed up the cylinder. Suddenly the horsing around was over. This thing was somebody's memory. I dropped onto a bench to examine it, my Valonian-inspired pulse pounding. Where the heck did this come from, cat? I asked. It's jumped up into my lap, and nosed the cylinder. I was trying to hark back to those days three years before when I had loaded the lifeboat with all the loot it would carry for the trip back to Earth. Listen, it's, we've got to do some tall remembering. Let's see. There was a whole rack of blanks in the memory recharging section of the room where we found the three skeletons. Yeah, now I remember. I pulled this one out of the recorder set, which means it had been used but not yet color-coded. I showed it to Foster when he was hunting his own trace. He didn't realize I'd pulled it out of the machine, and he thought it was an empty. But I'll bet you somebody had his mind taped and then left in a hurry before the trace could be color-coded and filed. On the other hand, maybe it's a blank that had just been inserted when somebody broke up the playhouse. But wasn't there something Foster said about when he woke up way back when, with a pile of fresh corpses around him? He gave somebody emergency treatment, and to a Valonian that would include a complete memory transcription. Do you realize what I've got here in my hand, it's? She looked up at me inquiringly. This is what's left of the guy that Foster buried. His pal, Amerlin, I think he called him. 
What's inside this cylinder used to be tucked away in the skull of the ancient sinner. The guy's not so dead after all. I'll bet his family will pay plenty for this trace and be grateful besides. That'll be an ace in the hole in case I get too hungry on Valen. I got up and crossed the apartment. It's followed me out to my sleeping couch. I dropped the trace in a drawer beside Foster's own memory. Wonder how Foster's making out without his past. It's... He claimed the one I've got here would only be a copy of the original stored at Akamaloth, but my briefing didn't say anything about copying memories. He must be somebody pretty important to rate that service. Suddenly my eyes were riveted to the markings on Foster's trace lying in the drawer. Splood! The royal colors! I sat down on the bed with a lurch. It's Zenka, old gal. It looks like we'll be entering Valonian society from the top. We've been consorting with a member of the Valonian nobility. During the days that followed, I tried again and again to raise Foster on the communicator, without result. I wondered how I'd find him among the millions on the planet. My best bet would be to get settled down in the Valonian environment, then start making a few inquiries. I would play it casually, act the part of a Valonian who had merely been traveling for a few hundred years, which wasn't unheard of, and play my cards close to my gravy stains until I learned what the score was. With my Valonian briefing, I ought to be able to carry it off. The Valonians might not like illegal immigrants any better than they did back home, so I'd keep my interesting foreign background to myself. I would need a new name. I thought over several possibilities and selected Durgon. It was as good a Valonian jawbreaker as any. I canvassed the emergency wardrobe that was standard equipment on Far Voyager lifeboats. There was everything from fur-lined parka-type suits for outings on worlds like Pluto to sheer silk one-man air conditioner balloon overalls for stepping out on Venus. In amongst them was a selection of dresses reminiscent of ancient Greece. They had been the sharp style of Valen when Foster left home. They looked comfortable. I picked one in a sober color then got busy with the cutting and seaming unit to fit it to my frame. I didn't plan to attract unnecessary attention with ill-fitting garments when I crossed my first Valonians. It's Zenka watched with interest. What the heck am I going to do with you on Valen? The only cat on the planet. You may have to put up with an Igurfin for a boyfriend, I said, searching my Valonian memory. They're about the nearest thing to you in size and shape but they're kind of objectionable, personality-wise. I finished off my new duds, then dug through the handicrafts gear and picked out a sheet of caffite, a copper-like Valonian alloy that was supposed to have almost the durability of calf without being so hard to work. There were appropriate tools in the little workshop for shaping it and adding decoration. Don't worry, I said to Itz. You won't go ashore shabbily clad either. You'll be a knockout in this item. I parked her on the workbench and sat down to my tools. I clipped out an inch-wide strip of the caffite, shaped it into a circle, and fitted it with a slip-out catch. After a leisurely meal, I spent what passed for an evening etching Itzenka on the collar with plenty of curly cues. Then I fitted it on her. She didn't seem to mind a bit. There! all set to wow those Valonians like they've never been wowed. It's Zenka purred. We strolled into the observation lounge. Strange, bright-hued star systems glowed far away. We'll be stepping out with our memories any night now, I said. The proximity alarms were ringing. I watched the screen with its image of a great green world rimmed on one edge with glaring white from the distant giant sun, on the other flooded with a cool glow reflected from the blue outer planet. The trip was almost over, and my confidence was beginning to fray around the edges. In a few minutes I would be stepping into an unknown world, all set to find my old pal Foster and see the sights. I didn't have a passport, but there was no reason to anticipate trouble. All I had to do was let my natural identity take a back seat and allow my Valonian background to do the talking. And yet, now, 
Valen spread out below us a misty gray-green landscape, bright under the glow of the immense moon-like sister world, Sinta. I had set the landing monitor for Ak Hamalaf, the capital city of Valen. That was where Foster would have headed, I guessed. Maybe I could pick up the trail there. The city was directly below, a vast network of blue-lit avenues. I hadn't been contacted by planetary control. That was normal enough, however. A small vessel coming in on auto could handle itself. A little apprehensively, I ran over my lines a last time. I was Durgon, citizen of the two worlds, back from a longer-than-average season of far voyaging, and in need of briefing rods to bring me up to date on developments at home. I also required assignment of quarters. My tailoring was impeccable, my command of the language a little rusty from long non-use, and the only souvenirs I had to declare were a tattered native costume from my last port of call, a quaint weapon from the same, and a small animal I had taken a liking to. The landing ring was visible on the screen now, coming slowly up to meet us. There was a gentle shock, and then absolute stillness. I watched the port cycle open. I went to it and looked out at the pale city stretching away to the hills. I took a breath of the fragrant night air spiced with a long-forgotten perfume, and the part of me that was now Valonian ached with the inexpressible emotion of homecoming. I started to buckle on my pistol and gather up a few belongings, then decided to wait until I'd met the welcoming committee. I whistled to Izenka, and we stepped out and down. We crossed the clipped green. Luminous in the glow from the lights over the high-arched gate, marking the path that curved up toward the bright-lit terraces above. There was no one in sight. Bright scintillite showed me the gardens and walks, and when I reached the terraces, the avenues beyond, but no people. I stood by a low wall of polished marble and thought about it. It was about midnight and the nights on Valen lasted twenty-eight hours, but there should have been some activity here. This was a busy port. Scheduled vessels, private yachts, official ships, all of them came and went from Akamaloth. But not tonight. The cat and I walked across the terrace, passed through the open arch to a refreshment lounge. The low tables and cushioned couches stood empty under the rosy light from the ceiling panels. My slippered feet whispered on the polished floor. I stood and listened. Dead silence. There wasn't even the hum of a mosquito. All such insect pests had been killed off long ago. The lights glowed. The tables waited invitingly. How long had they waited? I sat down at one of them and thought hard. I had made a lot of plans, but I hadn't counted on a deserted spaceport. How was I going to ask questions about Foster if there was no one to ask? I got up and moved on through the empty lounge, past a wide arcade, out onto a terraced lawn. A row of tall, poplar-like trees made a dark wall beyond a still pool, and behind them distant towers loomed, colored lights sparkled. A broad avenue swept in a wide curve between fountains slanted away to the hills. A hundred yards from where I stood, a small vehicle was parked at the curb. I headed for it. It was an open two-seater, low-slung, cushioned, finished in violet inlays against bright chrome. I slid into the seat, looked over the controls, while Itzenka skipped to a place beside me. There was a simple lever arrangement, a steering tiller. It looked easy. I tried a few pulls and pushes. Lights blinked on the panel, the car quivered, lifted a few inches, drifted slowly across the road. I moved the tiller, twiddled things. The car moved off toward the towers. I didn't like the controls. A wheel and a couple of foot pedals would have suited me better. But it beat walking. Two hours later we had cruised the city and found nothing. It hadn't changed from what my extra memory recalled except that all the people were gone. The parks and boulevards were trimmed, the fountains and pools sparkled, the lights glowed, but nothing moved. The automatic dust precipitators and air filters would run forever, 
keeping things clean and neat, but there was no one there to appreciate it. I pulled over, sat watching the play of colored lights on a waterfall, and considered. Maybe I'd find more of a clue inside one of the buildings. I left the car and picked one at random, a tall slab of pink crystal. Inside, I looked around at a great airy cavern full of rose-colored light and listened to the purring of the cat in my own breathing. There was nothing else to hear. I picked a random corridor, went along it, passed through empty rooms. It was all in the old Valonian style. Walls paneled in jade, brocades hanging in iridescent colors, rugs like pools of fire. In one chamber I picked up a cloak of semi-velvet and put it over my shoulders. I was getting cold in my daytime street dress. Walking among the tangible ghosts of the long past didn't warm me up any. We climbed a wide spiral stair, passed from vacant room to vacant room. I thought of the people who had once used them. Where were they now? I found a clarinet-like musical instrument and blew a few notes on it. It had a deep, mellow tone that echoed along the deserted corridor. I thought it sounded a lot like I felt, sad and forgotten. I went out onto a lofty terrace overlooking gardens, leaned on a balustrade, and looked up at the brilliant disk of Sinte. It looked enormous, its diameter four times that of the earthly moon. "'We've come a long way to find nothing,' I said to Itzenka. She pushed away along my leg and flexed her tail in a gesture meant to console, but it didn't help. After the long wait, the tension of expectation, I felt suddenly as empty as the silent halls of the building. I sat on the balustrade and leaned back against the polished pink wall, took out the clarinet and blew some blue notes. That which once had been was no more. Remembering it, I played the pavan for a dead princess, and felt a forlorn nostalgia for a glory I had never known. I finished, and looked up at a sound. Four tall men in grey cloaks and a glitter of steel came toward me from the shadows. I had dropped the clarinet and was on my feet. I tried to back up, but the balustrade stopped me. The four spread out. The man in the lead fingered a wicked-looking short club and spoke to me in gibberish. I blinked at him and tried to think of a snappy comeback. He snapped his fingers and two of the others came up. They reached for my arms. I started to square off, fist cocked, then relaxed. After all, I was just a tourist, Durgan by name. Unfortunately, before I could get my fist back, the man with the club swung it and caught me across the forearm. I yelled, jumped back, found myself grappled by the others. My arm felt dead to the shoulder. I tried a kick and regretted that too. There was armor under the cloaks. The club wielder said something and pointed at the cat. It was time I wised up. I relaxed, tried to coax my alter ego into the foreground. I listened to the rhythm of the language. It was Valonian, badly warped by time, but I could understand it. A musician should be an owner. Laughter. Whose man are you, Piper? What are your colors? I curled my tongue, tried to shape it around the sort of syllables I heard them uttering. It seemed to me a gross debasement of the Valonian I knew. Still, I managed an answer. I... I am a citizen of Valon. A dog of a masterless renegade? The man with the club hefted it, glowered at me. And what wretched dialect is that you speak? I have been long a voyaging, I stuttered. I ask for briefing rods and for a dwelling place. A dwelling place you'll have, the man said, in the men's shed at Rath Galleon. He gestured, and handcuffs snapped on my wrists. He turned and stalked away, and the others hustled me after him. Over my shoulder I got a glimpse of a cat's tail disappearing over the balustrade. Outside a long grey air car waited on the lawn. They dumped me in the back seat, climbed aboard. I got a last look at the spires of Ak Hamaloth as we tilted, hurtled away across the low hills. 
Somewhere in the shuffle I had lost my new cloak. I shivered. I listened to the talk, and what I heard didn't make me feel any better. The chain between my wrists kept up a faint jingling. I gathered I'd be hearing a lot of that kind of music from now on. I had had an idealistic notion of wanting to fit into this new world, find a place in its society. I'd found the place all right, a job with security. I was a slave. End of chapter 13「Chapter Fourteen of A Trace of Memory by Keith Laumer. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. It was banquet night at Rathgallion, and I gulped my soup in the kitchen and ran over in my mind the latest batch of jingles I was expected to perform. I had only been on the estate a few weeks, but I was already owner Gope's favorite piper. If I kept on at this rate, I would soon have a cell to myself in the slave pens. Syme, the pastry cook, came over to me. "'Pipe us a merry tune, Durgan,' he said, "'and I'll reward you with a frosting pot.' "'With pleasure, good Syme,' I said. I finished off the soup and got out my clarinet. I had tried out half a dozen strange instruments, but I still like this one best. "'What's your pleasure?' "'One of the outland tunes you learned far voyaging,' called Kagu, the bodyguard. I complied with the beer-barrel polka. They pounded the table and hallooed when I finished, and I got my goody-pan. Syme stood, watching me scrape at it. "'Why don't you claim the chief piper's place, Durgan?' Syme said. "'You pipe rings around the lout.' Then you'd have freeman status, and could sit among us in the kitchen almost as an equal. I went after the last of the charquilla frosting, licked my fingers, and laid the pot aside. I'd gladly be the equal of such a pastry cook as yourself, good Syme, I said. But what can a slave piper do? Syme blinked at me. You can challenge the chief piper, he said. There's none can deny you're his master in all but name. Don't fear the outcome of the trial. You'll triumph, sure. He glanced around at the kitchen staff. Is that not so, good men? I'll warrant it, the soup master said. If you lose, I'll take your stripes for you. You're going too fast for me, Goodman, I said. How can I claim another's place? Syme waved his arms. You have far voyaged long indeed, Piper Durgan. Know you naught of how the world wags these days? One would take you for a Scintian heretic. As I've said, Goodman, in my youth all men were free, and the high king ruled at Akamaloth. "'Tis ill to speak of these things," said Syme in a low voice. "'Only owners know their former lives. Though I've heard it said that long ago no man was so mean but that he recorded his lives and kept them safe. How you came by yours, I ask not, but do not speak of it. Owner Gope is a jealous master. Though a most generous and worshipful lord, he added hastily, looking around. I won't speak of it then, good Syme, I said, but I have been long away. Even the language has changed, so that I wrench my tongue in the speaking of it. Advise me, if you will. Syme puffed out his cheeks, frowning at me. "'I scarce know where to start,' he said. "'All things belong to the owners, as is only right.' He looked around for confirmation. The others nodded. "'Men of low skill are likewise property, and tis well tis so, else would they starve as masterless strays, if the Grayman failed to find the first. He made a sign and spat. So did everybody else. Now, men of good skill are freemen, each earning rewards as befits his ability. I am chief pastry cook to the Lord Gope, with the perquisites of that station, therefore that none other equals my talents. He looked around truculently, saw no challengers, and thus it is with us all. And if some varlet claims the place of any man here, put in Kagu, then he got to submit to the trial. Then, 
said Syme, pulling at his apron agitatedly. This upstart pastry cook must cook against me, and all in the hall will judge, and he who prevails is the chief pastry cook, and the other takes a dozen lashes for his impertinence. But fear not, Durgan, spoke Kagu. A chief piper ain't but a five-stroke man. Only a tutor is lower down among freemen. And anyway, the good soup master had promised to take the lash for you. There was a bellow from the door, and I grabbed my clarinet and scrambled after the page. Owner Gope didn't like to wait around for piper slaves. I saw him looming up at his place as I darted through to my assigned position within the huge circle of the viand-loaded table. The chief piper had just squeezed his bagpipe-like instrument and released a windy blast of discordant sound. He was a lean, squint-eyed creature, fond of ordering the slave pipers about. He pranced in an intricate pattern, pumping away at his vary-covered bladders until I winced at the screech of it. Owner Gope noticed him about the same time. He picked up a heavy brass mug and half rose to peg it at the chief piper, who saw it just in time to duck. The mug hit a swollen airbag, a yellow one with green tassels. It burst with a sour bleat. "'As sweet a note as has been played tonight,' roared Owner Gope. "'Begone, lest you call up the hill devils.' His eye fell on me. "'Here's Dugan, or Daigon, he cried. "'Now here's a true piper. "'Summon up a fair melody, Digrin, "'to clear the fumes of the last performer from the air "'before the wine sours.' "'I bowed low, wet my lips, "'and launched into the one o'clock jump. "'To judge from the roar that went up when I finished, "'they liked it. "'I followed with little brown jug and string of pearls. "'Go pounded, and the table quieted down. "'The rarest slave in all Rathgallion, I swear it,' he bellowed. "'Were he not a slave, I'd drink his health.' "'By your leave, owner?' I said. Gope stared, then nodded indulgently. "'Speak then, Dugong,' he said. "'I claim the place of Chief Piper. I—' Yells rang out. Gope grinned widely. "'So be it.' he said. Shall the vote be taken now, or must we submit to more of the vile blatterings ere we proclaim our good Dagrin, Chief Piper? Proclaim him! somebody shouted. There must be a trial, another offered dubiously. Gope slammed a huge hand against the table. Bring Lilk, the Chief Piper, before me, he yelled. He of the wretched airskins. The piper reappeared, fingering his bladders nervously. "'The place of the chief piper is declared vacant,' Gope said loudly. The piper pinched a pink bladder, which emitted a thin squeak. "'Since the former chief piper has been advanced in degree to a new office,' continued Gope. A blue bladder moaned, lost amid yells and cheers. "'Let these airbags be punctured!' Gope cried. I banished their rancid squeals forever from Rathgallion. Now, let all know, this former piper is now chief fool to this household. Let him wear the broken bladders as a sign of his office. There was a roar of laughter, glad cries, whistles. Volunteers leaped to rip the colored airbags. They died in a final flurry of trills and flutters. A fool slave tied the draggled instrument to the ex-piper's head. I gave them mersey dotes, and the former piper capered gingerly. Owner Gope roared with laughter. I followed with the dipsy doodle, and the new fool, encouraged by success, leaped and grimaced, pirouetted, strutted, bladders bobbing. The crowd laughed until the tears flowed. A great day for Rathgallion, Gope shouted. By the horns of the sea god, I have gained a prince of pipers and a king of fools. I proclaim them to be ten lash men, and both shall have places at table henceforth. The fool and I followed up with three more numbers, 
Then Gope let us squeeze into a space on a hard bench at the far side of the table. A table slave put loaded plates before us. "'Well done, good Durgan,' he whispered. "'Do not forget us slaves in your new honor. "'Don't worry,' I said, sniffing the aroma of a big slab of roast beef. "'I'll be sneaking down for a snack every night about Cinterrise. I looked around the barbarically decorated hall, seeing things in a new way. There's nothing like a little slavery to make a man appreciate even a modest portion of freedom. Everything I had thought I knew about Valen had been wrong. The centuries that had passed had changed things, and not for the better. The old society that Foster knew was dead and buried. The old palaces and villas lay deserted the spaceports unused. And the old system of memory recording that Foster described was lost and forgotten. I don't know what kind of a cataclysm could have plunged the seat of a galactic empire back into feudal darkness, but it had happened. So far, I hadn't found a trace of Foster. My questions had gotten me nothing but blank stares. Maybe Foster hadn't made it. There could have been an accident in space. Or perhaps he was somewhere on the opposite side of the world. Valen was a big planet, and communications were poor. Maybe Foster was dead. I could live out a long life here and never find the answers. I remembered my own disappointment at the breakdown of my illusions that night at Akamaloth. How much more heartbreaking must have been Foster's experience when and if he had arrived back here. And now we were both in the same boat, with our memories of the old Valen and the dreary spectacle of the new providing plenty of food for bitterness. And Foster's memory that I had been bringing him for a keepsake. What a laugh that was! Far from being a superfluous duplicate of a master trace to which he had expected easy access, my copy of the trace was now, with the vaults at Akhamalath sealed and forbidden, of the greatest possible importance to Foster, and there wasn't a machine left on the planet to play it on. Well, I still meant to find Foster, if it took me... Owner Gope was humming loudly and tunelessly to himself. I knew the sign. I got ready to play again. Being Chief Piper probably wasn't going to be just one big bowl of cherries. But at least I wasn't a slave now. I had a long way to go. But I was making progress. Owner Gope and I got along pretty well. He was a shrewd old duck, and he liked having such an unusual piper on hand. He had heard from the Grey Men, the freelance police force, how I had landed at the deserted port. He warned me, in an oblique way, not to let word get out that I knew anything about old times in Valen. The whole subject was taboo especially the old capital city and the royal palaces themselves. Small wonder that my trespassing there had brought the Greymen down on me in double-quick time. Gope took me with him everywhere he went, by air car, ground car, or formal river barge. There were still a lot of vehicles around, though few people seemed to know how to use them, simple as they were to operate. The air cars were more useful, since they required no roads. But Go preferred the ground cars. I think he liked the sensation of speed he got barreling along at ninety or a hundred on one of the still-perfect roads that had originally been intended merely as scenic drives. One afternoon, several months after my promotion, I dropped in at the kitchen. I was due to shove off with owner Gope and his usual retinue for a visit to Bar Ponderone, a big estate a hundred miles north of Rathgallion, in the direction of Akhamaloth. Syme and my other old cronies fixed me up with a healthy lunch, and warned me that it would be a rough trip. The stretch of road we'd been using was a favorite hangout of road pirates. "'What I don't understand,' I said, "'is why Gope doesn't mount a couple of guns on the car and blast his way through the raiders.' Every time he goes off the estate, he's taken his life in his hands. The boys were shocked. Even piratical renegades would never dream of taking a man's life, good Durgan, 
Syme said. Every owner far and near would band together to hunt such miscreants down. And their own fellows wouldn't abet the hunters. Nay, none is so low as to steal all a man's lives. The Corsairs themselves know full well that in their next life they may be simple good men, even slaves, the chief wine-pourer put in. For you know, good Durgan, that when a member of a pirate band suffers the change, the others lead the new man to an estate that he may find his place. How often do these changes come along? I asked. It varies greatly. Some men of great strength and moral power have been known to go on unchanged for three or four hundred years. But the ordinary man lives a life of eighty to one hundred years. Syme paused. Or it may be less. A life of travail and strife can age one sooner than one of peace and retirement. Or unusual vicissitudes can shorten a life remarkably. A cousin of mine, who was marooned on the great stony place in the southern half-world, and who wandered for three weeks without more to eat or drink than a small bag of wine, underwent the change after only fourteen years. When he was found, his face was lined and his hair had grayed, in the way that presages the change, and it was not long before he fell in a fit, as one does, and slept for a night and a day. When he awoke, he was a new man, young and knowing nothing. Didn't you tell him who he was? Nay, Syme lowered his voice. You are much favored of owner Gope, good Durgan, and rightly. Still, there are matters a man talks not of. A new man takes a name and sets out to learn whatever trade he can, put in the carver of roasts. By his own skills he can rise, as you have risen, good Durgan. "'Don't you have memory machines or briefing rods?' I persisted. "'Little black sticks. You touch them to your head and—' Syme made a motion in the air. "'I have heard of these wands, a forbidden relic of the black arts.' "'Nuts!' I said. "'You don't believe in magic, do you, Syme? "'The rods are nothing but a scientific development by your own people. "'How you've managed to lose all knowledge of your own past.' Syme raised his hands in distress. "'Good Durgan, press us not in these matters. Such things are forbidden.' "'Okay, boys. I guess I'm just nosy.' I went on out to the car and climbed in to wait for Owner Gope. Trying to learn anything about Valen's history was about like questioning a village of Eskimos about the great trek over from Asia. They didn't know anything. I had reached a few tentative conclusions on my own, however. My theory was that some sudden social cataclysm had broken down the system of personality reinforcement and memory recording that had given continuity to the culture. Felonian society, based as it was on the techniques of memory preservation, had gradually disintegrated. Valen was plunged into a feudal state resembling its ancient social pattern of 50,000 years earlier, prior to the development of memory recording. The people huddled together on estates for protection from real or imagined perils, and shunning the old villas and cities as taboo, except for those included in estates, knew nothing of space travel and ancient history. Like Syme, they had no wish even to speak of such matters. I might have better luck with my detective work on a big estate like Bar Ponderone. I was looking forward to today's trip. I was cramped on Rath Galleon. It was a small, poor estate, covering only about twenty square miles, with half a dozen villages of farmers and craftsmen, and the big house of owner Gope. I had seen all of it, and it was a dead end. Gope appeared, with Kagu and two other bodyguards, four dancing girls, and an extra-large gift hamper. They took their places, and the driver started up and wheeled the heavy car out onto the high road. I felt a pulse of excitement as we accelerated in the direction of Bar Ponderone. Maybe at the big estate I'd get news of Foster. We were doing about fifty down a winding mountain road. I was in the front seat beside the driver, fiddling with my clarinet and watching the road from the corner of my eye. I was wishing the driver's knuckles didn't show white on the speed-control lever. 
He drove like a drunken spinster, fast but nervous. It wasn't entirely his fault. Gope insisted on plenty of speed. I was grateful for the auto-steer mechanism. At least we couldn't drive over a cliff. We rounded a curve, the wheel screeching from the driver's awkward, too-fast swing into the turn, and saw another car in the road a quarter of a mile ahead, not moving but parked, sideways. The driver hit the brakes. Behind us, owner Gope yelled, Pirates! Don't slacken your pace, driver! But, but, owner Gope! The driver gasped. Ram the blackguards if you must! Gope shouted. But don't stop! The girls in the back yelped in alarm. The flunkies set up a wail. The driver rolled his eyes, almost lost control, then gritted his teeth, reached out to switch off the anti-collision circuit, and slammed the speed control lever against the dash. I watched for two long heartbeats as we roared straight for the blockading car, then I slid over and grabbed for the controls. The driver held on, frozen. I reared back and clipped him on the jaw. He crumpled into his corner, mouth open and eyes screwed shut, as I hit the auto-steer override and worked the tiller. It was an awkward position for steering, but I preferred it to hammering in at ninety per. The car ahead was still sitting tight, now a hundred yards away, now fifty. I cut hard to the right toward the rising cliff face. The car backed to block me. At the last instant I whipped to the left, barreled past with half an inch to spare, rocketed along the ragged edge with the left wheel rolling on air, then whipped back into the center of the road. "'Well done!' yelled Kagu. "'But they'll give chase!' Gope shouted. "'Assassins! Masterless swine!' The driver had his eyes open now. "'Crawl over me!' I barked. He mumbled and clambered past me, and I slid into his seat, still clinging to the accelerator lever and putting up the speed. Another curve was coming up. I grabbed a quick look in the rear viewer. The pirates were swinging around to follow us. "'Press on!' commanded Gope. "'We're close to Bar Ponderone. It's no more than five miles.' "'What kind of speed have they got?' I called back. "'They'll beat us easy!' said Kagu cheerfully. What's the road like ahead? A fair road, straight and true, now that we've descended the mountain, answered Gope. We squealed through the turn and hit a straightaway. A curving road branched off ahead. What's that? I snapped. A winding trail, gasped the driver. It comes on Bar Ponderum, but by a longer way. I gauged my speed, braked minutely, and cut hard. We howled up the steep slope into a turn between hills. Gope shouted, What madness is this? Are you in league with the villains? We haven't got a chance on the straightaway, I called back. Not in a straight speed contest. I whipped the tiller over, then back the other way, following the tight S-curves. We flashed past magnificent vistas of rugged peaks and rolling plains, but I didn't have time to admire the view. There were squeals from the odalisks in the rear seats, a gabble of excited talk. I caught a glimpse of our pursuers, just heading into the side road behind us. "'Any way they can head us off?' I yelled. "'Not unless they have Confederates stationed ahead,' said Gope. "'But these pariahs work alone.' I worked the brake and speed levers, handled the tiller. We swung right, then left, higher and higher, then down a steep grade, and up again. The pirate car rounded a turn, only a few hundred yards behind now. I scanned the road ahead, followed its winding course along the mountainside, through a tunnel, then out again to swing around the shoulder of the next peak. "'Pitch something out when we go through the tunnel!' I yelled. "'Anything!' "'My cloak!' cried Gope. "'And the gift hamper!' One of the flunkies started to moan. The girls caught the fever joined in with shrill lamentations. "'Silence!' roared Gope. "'Lend a hand here, or by the sea-devil's beard you'll be jettisoned with the rest.' We roared into the tunnel mouth. There was a blast of air as the rear deck cover opened. Gope and Kagu hefted the heavy gift hamper, tumbled it out, 
followed it with a cloak, a wine jug, assorted sandals, bracelets, fruit. Then we were back into the sunlight, and I was fighting the curve. In the rear viewer I saw the pirates burst from the tunnel mouth. Cope's black and yellow cloak spread over the canopy. Smashed fruit spattered over it, the remains of the hamper dragging under the chassis. The car rocked, and a corner of the cloak lifted, clearing the driver's view barely in time. "'Tough luck,' I said. "'We've got a long, straight stretch ahead, and I'm fresh out of ideas.' The other car gained. I held the speed bar against the dash, but we were up against a faster car. It was a hundred yards behind us, then fifty, then pulling out to go alongside. I slowed imperceptibly, let him get his front wheels past us, then cut sharply. There was a clash of wheel fairings, and I fought the tiller as we rebounded from the heavier car. He crept forward, almost alongside again. Shoulder to shoulder we raced at ninety-five down the steep grade. I hit the brakes and cut hard to the left, slapped his right rear wheel, slid back. He braked too. That was a mistake. The heavy car lost traction, sliding. In slow motion, off-balanced in a skid, it rose on its nose, plowing up a cloud of dust. The hamper whirled away, the cloak fluttered and was gone, then the pirate car seemed to float for an instant in air, before it dropped wheels up out of sight over the sheer cliff. We raced alone down the slope and out onto the wooded plain toward the towers of Bar Ponderone. A shout went up. Owner Gope leaned forward to pound my back. "'By the nine eyes of the hill devil!' he bellowed. "'Masterfully executed! The Prince of Pipers is a prince of drivers, too. This night you'll sit by my side at the ring board at Bar Ponderone in a rank of a hundred lash chief driver. I swear it!' Compared with making a left turn off the outer drive at 5.15 on a Friday, that was nothing, I said. I held on to the tiller and tried breathing again. I'd been a fool to try to flip a heavier car, but it had worked, and now I'd gotten another promotion. I was doing okay. And let no man raise a charge of assassination, Cope went on. I'll not see so clever a driver piper immured. I charge you all, say nothing of this. We'll consider that the rascals merely outdid themselves in their villainy. That was the first I'd thought of that angle. To take a human life was still the one unthinkable crime in this world of immortals, because you took not just one, but all a man's lives. The punishment was walling up for life. But just one life. In my case, one would be enough. I didn't have any spares. I had taken a bigger chance with Gope than I had with the pirates. Life here was a series of gambles, but it looked like the chance-takers got ahead fast. My best bet was to stay on the make and calculate the odds when it was over. I spent the first day at Bar Ponderone rubbernecking the tall buildings and keeping an eye open for Foster, on the off chance that I might pass him on the street. It was about as likely as running into an old high school chum from Perth Amboy among the body servants of the Shah of Afghanistan, but I kept looking. By sunset I was no wiser than before. Dressed in the latest in Valonian cape and ruffles, I was sitting with my buddy Kagu, chief bodyguard to owner Gope, at a small table on the first terrace at the Palace of Merrymaking, Bar Ponderone's biggest community feasting hall. It looked like a Hollywood producer's idea of a 21st century nightclub, complete with nine dance floors and five levels, indoor pools, fountains, 2,000 tables, musicians, girls, noise, colored lights, and food fit for an owner. It was open to all 50 lash goodmen of the estate and to guests of equivalent rank. After the backcountry life at Rathgallion, it looked like the big time to me. Kagu was a morose-looking old cuss, but good-hearted. His face was cut and scarred from a thousand encounters with other bodyguards, and his nose had been broken so often that it was invisible in profile. "'Where do you manage to get in all the fights, Kagu?' I asked him. 
I've known you for three months, and I haven't seen a blow struck in anger yet. Here! He grinned, showing me some broken front teeth. Swell places, these big estates, good Durgan. Lots of action. What do you do, get in street fights? Nah. The boys show up down here, tank up, cruise around, you know. They start fights here, in the dining room? Sure. Good crowd here. Lots of laughs. I picked up my drink, raised it to Kagu, and got it in my lap as somebody jostled my arm. I looked up. A battle-scarred thug stood over me. Who's a punk, Kagu? he said in a hoarse whisper. He probed at a back tooth with the silver pick, rolled his eyes from me to my partner. Kagu stood up and threw a punch to the other plug ugly's paunch. He oofed, clinched, eyed me resentfully over Kagu's shoulder. Kagu pushed him away, held him at arm's length. How's a boy, Mull? he said. Lay off of my sidekick. Greatest little piper in the business, and a top driver, too. Mull rubbed his stomach, sat down beside me. You're losing your punch, Kagu. He looked at me. Sorry about that. I thought you was one of the guys. He signaled a passing waiter slave. Bring my friend a new suit. Make it snappy. Don't the customers kind of resent it when you birds stage a heavyweight bout in the aisle? I asked. A drink in the lap is routine. It could happen in any joint in Manhattan. But a seven-course meal would be overdoing it. Nah, we moved down into the spot. He waved a thumb in the general direction of somewhere else. He looked me over. Where you been, Piper? Your first time in the palace? Durgan's been traveling, said Kagu. He's okay. Let me tell you the time these pirates pull one. See? Kagu and Mull swapped lies while I worked on my drinking. Although I hadn't learned anything on my days looking around at Bar Ponderone, it was still a better spot for snooping than Rathgallion. There were two major cities on the estate and scores of villages. Somewhere among the population I might have better luck finding someone to talk history with, or someone who knew Foster. Hey, growled Mull, look who's coming. I followed his gaze. Three thick-set thugs swaggered up to the table. One of them, a long-armed gorilla at least seven feet tall, reached out, took Kagu and Mull by the backs of the necks, and cracked their skulls together. I jumped up, ducked a hoof-like fist, and saw a beautiful burst of fireworks, followed by soothing darkness. I fumbled in the dark with the lengths of cloth entangling my legs, sat up, cracked my head. I groaned, freed a leg from the chair rungs, groped my way out from under the table. A waiter-slave helped me up, dusted me off. The seven-foot lout lolling in a chair glanced my way, nodded. "'You shouldn't hang out with lugs like that mull,' he said. "'Kagu told me you was just a piper. But the way you come out of that chair—' He shrugged, turned back to whatever he was watching. I checked a few elbow and knee joints, worked my jaw, tried my neck. All okay. "'You the one that slugged me?' I asked. Huh? Yeah. I stepped over to his chair, picked a spot, and cleared my throat. Hey, you, I said. He turned, and I put everything I had behind a straight right to the point of the jaw. He went over, feet in the air, flipped the rail, and crashed down between two tables below. I leaned over the rail. A party of indignant tally clerks stared up at me. Sorry, folks, I said. He slipped. A shout went up from the floor some distance away. I looked. In a cleared circle, two levels below, a pair of heavy-shouldered men were slugging it out. One of them was Kagu. I watched, saw his opponent fall. Another man stepped in to take his place. I turned and made my way down to the ringside. Kagu exchanged haymakers with two more opponents before he folded and was hauled from the ring. I propped him up in a chair, fitted a drink into his fist, and watched the boys pound each other. It was easy to see why the scarred face was the sign of their craft. 
There was no defensive fighting whatever. They stood toe-to-toe -to -toe and hit as hard as they could, until one collapsed. It wasn't fancy, but the fans loved it. Kagu came, too, after a while, and filled me in on the other fighters' backgrounds. "'So they're all top boys,' he said. "'But it ain't like in the old days, when I was in my prime. I could have took any three of these bums. The only one maybe I would have had a little trouble with is Torbu.' "'Which one is he?' He ain't down there yet. He'll show to take on the last boys on their feet. More gladiators pushed their way to the spot, pulled off gaily patterned cloaks and waistcoats, and waded in. Others folded, were dragged clear, revived to down another shot and cheer on the fray. After an hour, the waiting line had dwindled away to nothing. The two battlers on the spot slugged, clinched, breathed hard, swung and missed. The crowd booed. Where's Torbu? Kagu wondered. Maybe he didn't come tonight, I said. Sure, you met him. He knocked you under the table. Oh, him. Where'd he go? The last I saw, he was asleep on the floor. How's that? I didn't much like him slugging me. I clobbered him one. Hey, yelped Kagu. His face lit up. He got to his feet. Hold it, I said. What's... Kagu pushed his way through to the spot, took aim, and floored the closest fighter, turned and laid out the other. He raised both hands above his head. Ruth Galleon got a champion, he bellowed. Ruth Galleon takes on all comers. He turned, waved to me. Our boy, Durgan, he... There was a bellow behind me, even louder than Kagu's. I turned, saw Tobu, his hair must, his face purple, pushing through the crowd. Just a crummy minute, he yelled. I'm the champion around here. He aimed a haymaker at Kagu. Kagu ducked. Our boy Durgan laid you out cold, right? He shouted. So now he's the champion. I wasn't set, bawled Torbu. A lucky punch. He turned to the fans. I'm tired my shoelace, see? And this guy... Come on down, Durgan, Kagu called, waving to me again. We'll show... Torbu turned and slammed a roundhouse right to the side of Kagu's jaw. The old fighter hit the floor hard, skidded, lay still. I got to my feet. They pulled him to the nearest table, hoisted him into a chair. I made my way down to the little clearing in the crowd. A man bending over Kagu straightened, face white. I pushed him aside, grabbed the bodyguard's wrist. There was no pulse. Kagu was dead. Torbu stood in the center of the spot, mouth open. What? He started. I pushed between two fans, went for him. He saw me, crouched, swung. I ducked, uppercut him. He staggered back. I pressed him threw lefts and rights to the body, ducked under his wild swings, then rocked his head left and right. He stood, knees together, eyes glazed, hands down. I measured him, right crossed his jaw. He dropped like a log. Panting, I looked across at Kagu. His scarred face, white as wax, was strangely altered now. It looked peaceful. Somebody helped Torbu to his feet, walked him to the ringside. It had been a big evening. Now all I had to do was take the body home. I went over to where Kagu was laid out on the floor. Shocked people stood, staring. Torbu was beside the body. A tear ran down his nose, dripped on Kagu's face. Torbu wiped it away with a big, scarred hand. "'I'm sorry, old friend,' he said. "'I didn't mean it.' I picked Kagu up and got him over my shoulder. And, all the way to the far exit, it was so quiet in the palace of merrymaking that I could hear my own heavy breathing and the tinkle of fountains and the squeak of my fancy yellow plastic shoes. In the bodyguard's quarters, I laid Kagu out on a bunk, then faced the dozen scowling bruisers who stared down at the still body. Kagu was a good man, I said. Now he's dead. He died like an animal, for nothing. That ended all his lives, didn't it, boys? How do you like it? Mole glowered at me. 
You talk like we was to blame, he said. Kagu was my compere, too. Whose pal was he a thousand years ago? I snapped. What was he once? What were you? Valen wasn't always like this. There was a time when every man was his own owner. Look, you ain't of the Brotherhood, one thug started. So that's what you call it. But it's just another name for an old racket. A big shot sets himself up as dictator. We got our code, Mull said. Our job is to stick up for the owner, and that don't mean standing around listening to some japester calling names. I'm not calling names, I snapped. I'm talking rebellion. You boys have all the muscle and most of the guts in this organization. Why do you sit on your tails and let the boss live off the fat while you murder each other for the amusement of the patrons? I say let's pay him a call right now. You had a birthright once, but it's up to you to collect it before some more of you go the way Kagu did. There was an angry mutter. Torbu came in, face swollen. I backed up to a table, ready for trouble. Hold it, you birds, Torbu said. What's going on? This guy, he's talking revolt and treason, somebody said. He wants we should pull some rough stuff on owner Cooey himself. Torbu came up to me. You're a stranger around Bar Ponderone. Kagu said you was okay. You worked me over pretty good, and I got no hard feelings. That's the breaks. But don't try to start no trouble here. We got our code and our brotherhood. We look out for each other. That's good enough for us. Owner Cooey ain't no worse than any other owner. And by the code, we'll stand by him. Listen to me, I said. I know the history of Valen. I know what you were once and what you could be again. All you have to do is take over the power. I can lead you to the ship I came here in. There are briefing rods aboard, enough to show you... That's enough, Torbu broke in. He made a cabalistic sign in the air. We ain't getting mixed up in no taboo ghost boats or taking on no magicians or demons. Hogwash! That taboo routine is just a gag to keep you away from the cities so you won't discover what you're missing. I don't want to have to take you to the Grayman, Durgan, Torbu growled. Leave it lay. These cities, I plowed on, they're standing there empty, as perfect as the day they were built. And you live in these flea-bitten quarters jammed inside the town walls so the Grayman and renegades won't get you. You want to run things here? Mull put in. Go see Cooey. Let's all go see Cooey, I said. That's something you'll have to do alone, said Torbu. You better move on, Durgan. I ain't turning you in. I know how you felt about Kagu getting killed and all. But don't push it too far. I knew I was licked. They were as stubborn as a team of mules and just about as smart. Torbu motioned. I followed him outside. You want to turn things upside down, don't you? I know how it is. You ain't the first guy to get ideas. We can't help you. Sure, things ain't like they used to be here. And probably they never were. But we got a legend. Some day the Arthur will come back, and then the good time will come back, too. What's the Arthur? I said. Kind of like a big shot owner. There ain't no Arthur now. But a long time ago, back when our first life started, there was a Arthur that was owner of all Valen, and everybody lived high and had all their lives. Torbu stopped, eyed me warily. Don't say nothing to nobody, he went on, about what I've been telling you. That's a secret of the Brotherhood. But it's kind of like a hope we got. That's what we're waiting for through all our lives. We got to do the best we can and keep true to the Code and the Brotherhood. And some day the Arthur will come back, maybe. Okay, I said. Dream on, big boy. And while you're treasuring your rosy dreams, you'll get your brains kicked out like Kagu. I turned away. 
Listen, Durgan, it's no good bucking the system. It's too big for one guy. Or even a bunch of guys. But... I looked up. Yeah? If you gotta stick your neck out, see owner Gope. Abruptly, Torbu turned and pushed back through the door. See owner Gope, huh? Okay, what did I have to lose? I headed back along the corridor toward owner's country. I stood in the middle of the deep pile carpet in Gope's suite, trying to keep my temper hot enough to supply the gall I needed to bust in on an owner in the middle of the night. He sat in his ceremonial chair and stared at me impassively. With your help or without it, I said, I'm going to find the answers. Yes, good Durgan, he said, not bellowing for once. I understand. But there are matters you know not of. Just get me back into the spaceport, noble Gope. I have enough briefing rods aboard to prove my point, and a few other little items to boot. It's forbidden. You do not understand. I understand too much, I snapped. He straightened, eyed me with a touch of the old ferocity. Mind your tone, Durgan. I'm owner. I broke in. Do you remember Kagu? Maybe you remember him as a new man, young, handsome, like a god out of some old legend. You've seen him live his life. Was it a good life? Did the promise of youth ever get paid off? Gope closed his eyes. Stop, he said. This is bad. Bad. And the deaths they died I have watched beside, and the lives they led were mine, I quoted. Are you proud of them? And what about yourself? Don't you ever wonder what you might have been back in the good time? Who are you? asked Gope, his eyes fixed on mine. You speak old Valonian, you rake up the forbidden knowledge, and challenge the very powers. He got to his feet. I could have you immured, Durgan. I could hand you to the Greyman for a fate I shudder to name. He turned and walked the length of the room restlessly, then turned back to me and stopped. Matters stand ill with this fair world, he said. Legend tells us that once men lived as the high gods on Valon. There was a mighty owner, Arthur of all Valon. It is whispered that he will come again. Your legends are all true. You can take my word for that. But that doesn't mean some supernatural sugar daddy is going to come along and bail you out. And don't get the idea I think I'm the fabled answer to prayers. All I mean is that once upon a time, Valen was a good place to live, and it could be again. Right now, it's like a land under an enchantment. And you sleeping beauties need waking up. Your cities and roads and ships are still here, intact. But nobody knows how to run them, and you're all afraid to try. Who scared you off? Who started the rumors? What broke down the memory recording system? Why can't we all go to Ak Hamaloth and use the archives to give everybody back what he's lost? Those are dread words, said Gope. There must be somebody behind it. Or there was once. Who is he? Gope thought. There is one man preeminent among us. The great owner. Owner of owners. Omadurat, by name. Where he dwells, I know not. This is a secret possessed only by his intimates. What does he look like? How do I get to see him? Gope shook his head. I have seen him but once, closely cowled. He is a tall man, and silent. Tis said, Gope lowered his voice, By his black arts he possesses all his lives. An aura of dread hangs about him. Never mind that, Jazz, I said. He's a man like other men. Stick a knife between his ribs, and you'll put an end to him, aura and all. I do not like this talk of death. Let the doer of evil deeds be immured. It is sufficient. First, let's find him. How can I get close to him? There are those owners who are his confidants, said Gope, his trusted agents. It is through them that we small owners learn of his will. Can we enlist one of them? Never. They are bound to him by ties of darkness, spells, and incantations. I am a fast man with a pair of loaded dice myself. It's all done with mirrors. Let's stick to the point, noble Gope. 
How can I work into a spot with one of these big shots? Nothing easier. A driver and piper of such skills as your own can claim what place he chooses. How about bodyguarding? Suppose I could take a heavy named Torbu. Would that set me in better with a new owner? Such is no place for a man of your abilities, good Durgan, Gope exclaimed. True, tis a place most close to an owner, but there is much danger in it. The challenge to a bodyguard involves the most bloody hand-to-hand -hand combat, second only to the rigors of a challenge to an owner himself. What's that? I snapped. Challenge an owner? Be calm, good Durgan, said Gope, staring at me incredulously. No common man with his wits about him will challenge an owner. But I could if I wanted to? In sooth, if you have tired of life, of all your lives, tis as good a way to end them as another. But you must know, good Durgan, an owner is a warrior trained in the skills of battle. None less than another such may hope to prevail. I smacked my fist into my palm. I should have thought of this sooner. The cooks cook for their places, the pipers pipe, and the best man wins. It figures that the owners would use the same system. But what's the procedure, noble Gope? How do you get your chance to prove who can own the best? It is a contest with naked steel. It is the measure and glory of an owner that he alone stands ready to prove his quality against the peril of death itself. Gope drew himself up with pride. What about the bodyguards? I asked. They fight with their hands, good Durgan, and they lack skill with those. A death such as you describe tonight, that is a rare and sorry accident. It showed up this whole grubby farce in its true colors. A civilization like that of Valen, reduced to this. Still, it is sweet to live, by whatever rules. I don't believe that, and neither do you. What owner can I challenge? How do I go about it? Give up this course, good Durgan. Where's the nearest buddy of the big owner? Gope threw up his hands. Here, at Bar Ponderone. Owner Cooey, but... And how do I call his bluff? Gope put a hand to my shoulder. It is no bluff, good Durgan. It is long now since Owner Cooey stood to his blade to protect his place, but you may be sure he has lost none of his skill. Thus it was he won his way to Bar Ponderone, while lesser knights such as myself contented themselves with meaner fiefs. I'm not bluffing either, noble Gope, I said, stretching a point. I was no harness-maker in the good time. It is your death. Tell me how I offer the challenge, or I'll twist his nose in the main banqueting salon tomorrow night. Gope sat down heavily, raised his hands, and let them fall. If I tell you not, another will. But I will not soon find another piper of your worth. End of chapter 14